I think for most of us, when we think about Christianity, we naturally think about behaviors and actions. We think about rules and regulations. Uh, depending on the interactions you have with Christians or if you grew up in church, the kind of church environment you were in or you were around, those behaviors and actions and, and rules may look a little different. But we all tend to gravitate towards that, which is so interesting because when you read any of the four independent accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew was there, he saw it, and he wrote one. Mark got his information from Peter, he wrote one. Uh, Luke in, investigated and interviewed and researched and talked to a lot of people who were there, and he wrote an account. And then John was there himself, and he wrote one. You, you pick any of those accounts of Jesus' life, and you begin to look and pay attention to how Jesus interacted with people. And he never began with people by talking about behavior in the sense of obedience. He never looked at them and said, hey, there's some things you have to believe, and by the way, there's some behaviors that you have to, to fix if you're going to follow me and if you're going to get your life straightened out. He just never started there. Now, eventually he talked about that, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, but he never began with, you need to align all of this. Jesus began with a very, very different kind of invitation. He began with the invitation to follow, to follow. And follow in the most basic sense of the word. Follow in the sense of he was physically there, if you can imagine that. He was physically there, and so he would look at people who had questions and doubts about who he was because in the first century, they were no different than us. He shows up and he says to them, hey, I'm, I'm the Messiah you've been waiting for. I'm God in human flesh. And they're all going, how do we know that's true? Because they'd had a lot of people come through there and make that claim. So they had all the questions, they had all the doubts, they had all the skepticism that any of us would have. And when they did and began to express those doubts and those questions, Jesus did not get offended by that. He was not put off by that. As a matter of fact, Jesus would look at them and in a very literal sense. He would say, why don't you just follow me? In other words, why don't you just hang out with me and spend a little time with me? Why don't you, another way to think about this word, why don't you explore for yourself? How about you spend a little time with me and you watch what I do and you listen to what I say and then you look at how I live and you can decide for yourself if I am who I say I am. That was the first invitation that Jesus would extend to people when he would say, follow me, this is what he would mean. Now, I think that's great news for all of us because we have all at different times in our lives and some of you are there right now, we have all had doubts, we've all had questions, we've all been skeptical, we've all wondered, we've all been not sure. And that's perfectly fine with Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you have ever felt that, you have been in great company. Because all of his first followers felt that. They all started with questions. They all started with doubts. And they all started, in some cases, with some skepticism and some cynicism as well. But over time, as people spent time with Jesus, he would move from inviting them just to follow, and he would give them another invitation. He knew they're never, you know, and this is true for you too, you're never going to know unless you follow. You got to put some time in. You got to watch what Jesus did. You got to listen to what he said. You got to look at how he lived. But that in itself was not enough as people would follow over time. And it was different points in for everybody because everybody's different. But over time, he would look at them and he would offer a second invitation. It was an invitation not just to follow, but to believe, to believe. And that's what I want to talk about today for a few minutes, and we're going to talk about it some more next week because there's so much wrapped into this idea of belief. But I want to try to clear a few misconceptions up. Because believe, in the sense that Jesus talked about believe, it was not in some magical or mystical or even, you know, unusually spiritual sense. This was not Jesus looking at them saying, you need to believe more, you need to believe more, and you need to believe in all of my beliefs. And some of you, that's what you've been taught. You raise your hand and said, yeah, but what about, and people look back at you and said, you can't ask those questions. You need to believe. You just need to have more faith. Jesus never did that. Not once did one of his followers raise their hand. Not once did anybody in the first century. You don't see this in any of the accounts of Jesus' life. They raise their hand, they ask a question, and he said, no, 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 no. You just need to believe more. Don't ask that question. No. It was okay to follow, but eventually he would invite them to believe, and to believe specifically in the sense of trust. That's what that meant. To believe just meant to trust. Now, why in the world would Jesus invite people to trust, particularly to trust him? Well, for the same reason that we have every relationship we have. You see, trust is the starting point for all of your relationships, aren't they? And trust is the foundation for any of your relationships that you consider to be healthy relationships. That's true for me, too. Trust is what always begins a great relationship, and trust 
It's what all healthy relationships are built upon. It's what sustains a great relationship. Trust is at the heart of all of it. And because Jesus did not come, this is so important, Jesus did not come and invite people to believe in religion because he didn't do that. As a matter of fact, he showed up and said, religion as you have known it is over, is over. We can't fully understand just how shocking this was to them. He said, religion as you know it is over. I did not come to reinforce your religion. I came to put an end to it and to start something brand new. And because this was not about religion, because this was relational, Jesus' message was not about here are all the religious things you need to believe and here are all the religious behaviors you need to follow. Jesus' message was about trust. Because trust is at the heart of every great relationship. Now, some of you understand that in your friendships, some of you understand that in your marriage, but when it comes to a relationship with Jesus, you have a very hard time trusting. You have no problem following along, you have no problem exploring, and I think this is true for all of us at different points, isn't it? You have, you have no problem, you know, paying attention to, being curious about, but here's what you need to know, curiosity doesn't create a relationship, only trust does that. And when you get to the line and the edge where you need to step across and trust, you never seem to be able to do it. And you always back away and go, I'm just going to follow along a little more because I've got questions, I've got doubts, and I'm not sure, and what about this? And you know, you got all this thing going on. So I'm going to keep following along, but following along is optional. Following along has no commitment. You just, there's something in us that knows, oh man, the minute I trust, I commit. Because the minute I trust... I'm betting my future on Jesus. I'm betting my future that he is who he said he is and he did what he said he did. And I'm, I'm betting on the fact that I can't do what I need to do for myself to have a relationship with God. Or quite honestly, to even live this life well. So I am going to depend fully on Jesus and acknowledge I can't do it, but I think you can and I need your help. That's what trust looks like. And that is so difficult for some of us. We get to the line and we just can't clear the hurdles to do it. And my question to you is, why is that? Because we've all been there. Some of you are there right now. What is it that causes us to get to a point and then refuse to trust or refuse to believe? What we usually say is, well, I got these questions. Or, or you know, this doesn't add up. Or this doesn't make sense. Or I doubt this. Or I don't believe that's, you know, we have all of these things. But beyond that, I think there are a couple things at the root of what makes it hard for us to trust. These are true in any relationship, but they're especially true when it comes to trusting or believing in Jesus. So I want to take a few minutes today to talk about those two things. And to do that, I want to share with you a conversation Jesus had. I just think this is a fascinating conversation, and part of it is incredibly famous. You will probably have, uh, be familiar with part of this conversation. But the reason I think it's fascinating is because it is a conversation that Jesus had with not just a religious person, but one of the key religious leaders in the entire nation of Israel. And this was a guy who was fully devoted to religion, but his religion wasn't giving him answers to all of his questions. So he began to follow along or explore who Jesus was, in the very literal sense of the word, like Jesus was there. So he began listening to what Jesus had to say. He began watching what Jesus did. He began paying attention to all these stories he was hearing about Jesus and the teachings and you know, on and on. And as he began to follow, it just raised more questions for him. And so he gets to a point where he realizes he needs to trust, but he's just not sure he can trust. And as you're going to see as we unpack this, I think the same things that kept him from stepping across the line and trusting or depending on Jesus are the things that tend to hold us up at different points. So let me just read you the conversation, and then we'll talk about how it applies to us at the end. Here's how it begins. John, who was one of Jesus' disciples, and he was here to watch this whole interaction, says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. And the people who were reading John's account of Jesus' life, this meant a lot to them. It doesn't mean it nearly as much to us, so let me give you a little backstory. The Jewish ruling council was the most powerful religious group in the entire nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, they were basically a political group too. So they were just the most powerful group of people in Israel other than the Romans who occupied and controlled the land. And this ruling council was made up of 70 to 100, depending on the time, 70 to 100 different leaders who had basically formed an alliance with Rome and said, we know you're in charge, Rome. 
But if you will leave us in power and let us do our thing and let us enjoy our wealth and, you know, all the, all the power that we have and all, all the uh, stuff that comes with it, if you just leave us here, we will rule on your behalf. We'll make sure our country stays in line and does whatever you want them to do. Nicodemus was one of these people. They were experts in the Jewish scriptures. They were experts in the religion of Judaism. And they were running everything in the country. So this group of 70 to 100 people, they're made up of two subgroups. The Pharisees, Nicodemus was one of those, and another group called the Sadducees. These two groups had theological differences. So even though they were all part of the ruling council called the Sanhedrin, they couldn't get along, so they had their subgroups. And at times they would bicker and fight, and then at times they would all be united around getting something accomplished, and they would do it. That doesn't sound like our political system today at all, but it happened back then. So, so that's, that is what Nicodemus is a part of. Okay, And he, he's been paying attention to Jesus. He's been following along. He's been watching. And he decides, I've got so many questions. I need to go ask Jesus some of these. But he's not sure the right time to do it. And Jesus was not popular among this ruling council, so he didn't want everybody to know. So John tells us this, that he came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God we're not with him. Now, I think there are a couple clues to Nicodemus' struggle to trust that are found here. This sounds like it's complimentary. It sounds like, oh, yeah, you, you must like Jesus okay. But there are a couple things here. One is the fact that Nicodemus came at night. You know why he came at night? Because he didn't want anybody else in that ruling council to know he was curious. He didn't want anybody else to know... I'm paying attention and I'm starting to think that he really, this guy Jesus really is the Messiah. And so he, he comes at night when nobody else is going to know. He comes at night because he's afraid. That's part of the reason he can't trust Jesus. He just, there's just fear. The other reason he's having a hard time trusting Jesus is pride. And here's why I say that. Because when he addresses Jesus, and this sounds so respectful, but when he addresses Jesus, he says, okay, I've been paying attention to what you're doing, and it's clear you're somebody who's come from God. I mean, I've, I've seen you give sight to the blind. I've heard about you turn water into wine. I've heard about all of these miracles you're doing, and I'm listening to all of this teaching, which is fascinating. Clearly, you've got some connection to God. Now, that sounds nice, but here's the problem. Jesus didn't show up and look at guys like Nicodemus and tell them he was just a special prophet sent from God. Jesus had shown up and looked at them and said, I am God in human flesh. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, I'm the one you've been waiting on. I'm the Messiah. Now, here's what makes that so interesting. This Jewish ruling council, of which Nicodemus was a part, they actually, when they were first formed, they had one primary mission. Their job was to be an expert in the Jewish scriptures so that when the Messiah came, nobody would miss him. In other words, their job was to spot the Messiah when he showed up, because they knew all of the prophecies and all the signs to look for from their scriptures. And to be able to tell the whole nation, he's here, he's here. And there would be all these people throughout the history of Israel who would show up and claim to be the Messiah. And this group would check them out and go, nope, that's not. Nope, they're not. Nope, he's not. So they were supposed to spot Jesus. And yet when Jesus shows up, they miss him. And there's a little bit of pride in Nicodemus. Because for Nicodemus to show up and say, I've been watching everything you're doing. And I'm listening to everything you're teaching. And you're the one. Well, that means he's got to admit, and I missed you. We all missed you. We were, we were, this is our only job. We were supposed to find you. And so because of some fear and because of some pride, Nicodemus shows up because he has questions. He's curious. But as you're about to see, he just can't quite trust in. Now, what happens next is honestly pretty funny. And we read through this, and I think we lose a lot of the humor. But I think everybody sort of chuckled there because Jesus did something next that he did from time to time. It's as if Nicodemus had a list of questions on his phone, and he pulls it out, and he says, okay, we know you're important, and you're from God, and on and on. Now, I've got, you know, I've got some, he pulls out his phone, he's getting ready to ask the first question. Here's the first question, Jesus, and, and before he can ever ask it, Jesus interrupts him, and he answers the question Nicodemus has not asked, but is about to. Here's what he does. In reply... Jesus declared, well, I'll tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. It just seems so out of left field, right? But in, as they were sitting there that night, they all realized what happened, because Nicodemus' mouth drops open. He's like, 
well, how did you know? That was my first question. My first question was, I've been hearing you talk about the kingdom of God. Well, how do you become a part of that? Jesus says, oh, I knew that was your question. You're sitting here having doubts about who I am, so I thought this might help you. So I'm just going to read your mind and answer your question. And he throws this answer out there about what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, if I can just simplify all this down, what Jesus had been teaching was the kingdom of God was not anything religious. The kingdom of God was fully relational. The kingdom of God was understanding that we have each been created by our Heavenly Father to be a part of His family, to be forgiven and invited to be a part of His family forever. That's why God created us. And so Jesus looks at him and says, you want to be a part of the kingdom of God? You want to have a relationship that is personal with your Heavenly Father because it was not personal for them? He says, I'll tell you how. You have to be, and this is such a strange term, you have to be born again or born from above or born anew. And Nicodemus has no idea what this means. So he looks back at Jesus and he asks a great question. He says, well, how? Because that doesn't make any sense. How can a man be born when he's old? And then he says this, surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And I think when he said this, Jesus and Nicodemus both chuckled. They're like, well, no, that's ridiculous and gross for that matter. So we're not, you know, we're not going there. That doesn't make any sense. Nicodemus, now remember, he's an expert in the Jewish scriptures one of the religious leaders in the country, and he's sitting there listening to Jesus going, I don't understand. Well, Nicodemus, you ought to understand everything about the kingdom of God, shouldn't you? Nicodemus is going, no, no, no. Because my religion, the way I practice it, it is all about behavior. It is all about being good enough and doing enough to have God's favor. This is how it worked for them. They had 613 different laws that they tried to keep in order to keep God happy. That's what they believed. And Nicodemus was a professional at being and doing good. It was his only job. Show up every day, follow all the laws. That's what he did. So it was all behavioral for him. It was all transactional for him. And the idea or the thought that a relationship with God, that a, that a person could have something that was that relational, he couldn't wrap his mind around it. So he says, I don't get it. I don't understand. And Jesus tries to explain it to him. He says, I'll tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water. Okay, that's a physical birth. We all understand that. But also, he's got to be born of the Spirit. Oh, so you're talking about something that happens spiritually. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You shouldn't be surprised, Nicodemus, at my saying you must be born again. (laughs) To which Nicodemus is like, well, maybe not, but I am. I still don't get it. So he looks back, and I love this vulnerability, you know, he's, he's kind of let down his guard at this point. He's so curious, he's just got to keep asking questions. So he looks back and he says, well, how can this be? How can this be? Wait a minute. How can it be that we can have, that we can have a connection with God that is that relational? How can it be that this isn't about our behavior? Because again, that's all they had ever known. It was all religious for them. It wasn't relational in any sense. And Jesus, he has a little fun with Nicodemus at first. Here's what he says back. He says, you're Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? This is his way of going, okay, you're the expert. Your your whole job is to study and understand the Jewish scriptures. And this doesn't make any sense to you? And Nicodemus is like, nope, I missed all of this. This isn't a part of our religion at all. This is, our religion is completely behavior driven. And so Jesus then talks to Nicodemus and explains this to him by bringing up an Old Testament story that would not be familiar to most of us, but it was very familiar to Nicodemus because, again, Nicodemus was an expert in the Jewish scriptures. So he brings up this story of the people of Israel that happened after they left Egypt, before they entered the Promised Land. It happened with Moses. And he brings this up and he connects the dots for Nicodemus so he can understand just how relational this is going to be. And basically what he tells Nicodemus is this. You remember when God did this for Moses and the people of Israel in the desert? Yeah. Well, he's here to do it on a grand scale for you and for you and for all of humanity. Jesus says, I want you to look at me, Nicodemus. God is about to become as personal to you as he could ever be. Because I am here to communicate and demonstrate for you what God is like. And you're not going to get it now. But you're going to get it later. Because Nicodemus, you're going to watch me hang on a Roman cross. 
And you're going to realize in that moment that I'm doing it to pay for the sins of all mankind, that I'm going to die and rise again to pay the penalty for everyone's sins. So that you, Nicodemus, and all the other Jewish and non-Jewish people in this world can experience forgiveness and be a part of God's family once again. Nicodemus, you, and imagine this. He's going, Nicodemus, you are going to be standing there. And you're going to be, look, be able to look right into my eyes. And you're going to be able to see for yourself exactly what sacrificial, unconditional love looks like. And when he gets done explaining this, Jesus then makes a statement to Nicodemus that has become so famous. But he's trying to drive home this point of how much our Heavenly Father wants a relationship with us. So he says this, For God so loved the world. He's telling this to Nicodemus. Nicodemus didn't think God loved anybody but Jewish people, and honestly, not even all Jewish people, just Jewish people who followed all the laws. Jewish people who were good at being religious. Jesus says, nope. you got to expand this, Nicodemus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's me. That's why I'm here. And you don't understand now just what a sacrifice that was. But again, you're going to see it soon. I just told you. I just explained it. You're, you're going to see it with your own eyes. And then he goes on. He says that whoever believes in him, there's our word, shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, this was Jesus' way of looking at Nicodemus going, okay, I know you've been following along. I want to invite you now to believe in. I know you've been following along. You've been curious, and that's great. But curiosity is not what creates a relationship between you and your heavenly Father. It is time that you trust in me. That was Jesus' message. And guess what Nicodemus did? He walked away. Walked away having gotten to the edge of trusting, but not willing or able to step across and trust. And we know that because a few months later, Nicodemus is sitting in the council with all of those hundred leaders. And they are furious at Jesus because of something he's done. They're furious at Jesus, honestly, because he's so popular that he's threatening their power. And they decide in that council on that day, whatever it takes, we are going to kill this man. And Nicodemus stands up and he says, hey, hey, wait a minute. According to our law, we can't condemn a man to death until we first try him, until we bring him into court, until we you know, let him defend himself. And they begin to shout Nicodemus down because, again, Nicodemus is still curious. Nicodemus is still thinking there's something different about him that he's not willing to trust yet. And as they begin to shout Nicodemus down and remind him, no, 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 that man doesn't deserve that. You know what Nicodemus did? He just sat right back down. Because his fear was too great and his pride was too strong to choose to trust. Now, my question for you is this. What is it when you get to the line that makes it so hard for you to trust? Because we have all been there, haven't we? Those of us who've been following Jesus for a while, we still get to the point, those of us who are Christians, we still get to the point where, oh my goodness, it's so hard to trust. and We just won't do or can't do, it seems, what it is we know we ought to do next. And then there's some of you, you've been curious about Jesus for a while, and you've been exploring and asking questions, and you find things helpful that we talk about, and things helpful from the Bible, and things helpful Jesus taught. But when it comes to reaching a point where you're actually going to trust in and depend on Jesus for your forgiveness... And to bring you into God's family, you just can't clear that hurdle. You can't do it. What is it that keeps you and keeps me from trusting? I would suggest that at the root of it, it's the very same things Nicodemus faced. It's fear and it's pride. It's fear and it's pride. Fear in this sense. When you choose to trust anyone, you surrender some control, don't you? And that scares us all to death. When you choose to trust someone, you make yourself vulnerable. When you choose to trust someone, you are in essence saying, okay, I believe I can put my weight and my dependence on you. And I'm not going to try to control everything myself. And that is certainly true when it comes to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And for some of us, this is our problem. We get right to the edge and then we go, nope. But we don't want to acknowledge that we're afraid. 
So what we say is, well, wait a minute, I got questions about, and wait a minute, I still have doubts, and wait a minute, I'm still not sure about, and wait a minute, I need more information. And we give ourselves all of these reasons why we shouldn't trust in or believe in yet, but the reality is there's just a fear of surrendering control because surrendering always creates uncertainty, and uncertainty leads to fear. And so we stop because we're afraid. And then for others of us, we stop, and sometimes it's a combination of both, but sometimes it's, we stop because we're proud. We stop, we stop because I don't want to have to admit that I can't do all this on my own. I don't want to have to admit that I, I don't have all of this under control. I don't want to have to admit that, that I'm not good enough. And so we stop. Fear and pride, fear and pride. It keeps us from trusting. That's true in human relationships and is certainly true when it comes to trusting in Jesus. Fear and pride tend to paralyze us. Now we're going to talk more about the pride side next week. Don't miss that. But I want to talk for just a second about the fear side. What do you do when fear keeps you from trusting in? What do you do when you get right up to the edge and you just can't clear that hurdle because there is an underlying fear caused by the uncertainty? Is there anything that can overcome your fear and my fear? Well, guess what happened to Nicodemus? He finally overcame it. Here's what's fascinating to me. On the night of Jesus' arrest, Nicodemus is sitting in the ruling council, and they bring Jesus in, and they try him. Nicodemus is sitting right there. This is a group of people who were most responsible for Jesus' death. This is a group of people who led the crucify him chants. And Nicodemus was sitting there in the middle of it all. And Nicodemus got to watch with his own eyes as Jesus was brought before Pilate, as he was beaten. He got to watch Jesus carry that cross up the hill. He watched Jesus be nailed to a cross and hung there. And I think the minute he saw Jesus hanging on that cross, his mind went all the way back to that conversation he and Jesus had had a couple years before. And suddenly he remembered Jesus telling him, Nicodemus, you're going to see. You're going to look into my eyes and you're going to see what sacrificial, unconditional, God so loved the world kind of love looks like. And in that moment, it all broke through. Not broke through in the sense that Nicodemus was convinced Jesus was God in human flesh. That would come three days later. But it all broke through in the sense of he realized, oh my goodness, that is what unconditional love looks like. And so you know what he did? When Jesus died on that cross, Nicodemus and his buddy, who was also a Pharisee named Joseph, they came out of the shadows. And they went to Pilate, and they said, we would like permission to take his body and bury it in our tomb. Knowing that might cost them their place in the ruling council, knowing that was going to put a target on their back with all of the other leaders, knowing it could eventually cost them their lives. But that's what love had done. When Nicodemus looked in the eyes of love, it crushed his fear. So Joseph and Nick, they take Jesus, they take him to the tomb, they wrap him in 85 pounds of burial garments and different spices and ointments. He's got 85 pounds of weight on him. Nicodemus, as much as anyone can confirm, he is dead. They put him in the tomb. They roll the stone away. And they walk away like everybody else going, he must not have been God. Because God doesn't get crucified on a Roman cross. But oh my goodness, we've never seen love like that. And I think Nicodemus walked away with the same regrets that so many of Jesus' other followers walked away with. And he probably walked away with fear like everybody else over what's going to happen now. But three days later, he shows up at, a, at his tomb and finds it empty. And he looks in, and he knows exactly where he put Jesus, and everything is still there, but Jesus is gone. And then Nicodemus sees Jesus with his own eyes, and from that point forward, he had no more problem trusting. He was going to depend entirely on Jesus from that moment forward to do for him what he couldn't do for himself. He knew what a relationship with his Heavenly Father that was so personal really meant. Now, here's why I bring that up. Because there is only one thing that will help you overcome your fear and trust. And it is when you are willing to accept 
that you have a Father in heaven who loves you unconditionally. And you don't have to be afraid. And you don't have to wonder, and you don't have to worry about surrendering control, and you, you don't have to be concerned. On the other side of your trust is love. And on the other side of your decision to trust is unconditional acceptance. So, for those of you who are at a point right now where you've been following along, you're curious, you believe in God, and you love some of the stuff, and you know, all of that's great. But when it comes to Jesus, you just aren't willing yet to trust in him. This idea that, oh my goodness, you know, he died for my sins. I don't, I don't know that I want to surrender and acknowledge that. I don't, want to, I don't know that I want to surrender and acknowledge I'm not good enough on my own. I'm just afraid. I'm just proud. I'm just afraid. I'm just proud. If you are there, my question to you is, what will it take to get you to trust? The most rational decision you can make is to trust someone who loved you so much, he gave his life on a cross, and three days later he came back and rose again. Why? Because he's not inviting you to have blind belief or blind faith. He said, I have left you plenty of evidence that proves I am who I said I am, so you can trust me. So my question to you is, will you trust? You say, no, 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 man, I can't do that because I still have all these questions and doubts, and what about, and there was this time I don't feel like God came through for me. Okay, I get all that. Well, let me clear something up real quick. You do realize that trust is actually not earned. It's more than that. We always say, well, trust has to be earned. So once that person earns my trust, then I'll give it to them. But that's not how it works. That's not actually what you do. Let me tell you what you do. Trust is given and then verified. This is what you do. This is what you do in every healthy relationship in your life. You think about it. With every relationship you have that you value, you started by giving trust. And then you verified that that person was trustworthy. And then you gave some more trust and you verified they were trustworthy until hopefully you got to the point where you trusted them unconditionally. This is how trust works in any relationship. You give it and then verify it was a good decision. You give it and then verify that they're trustworthy. And this is what Jesus is inviting you to do today. He is simply inviting you to give him your trust and then verify that he's trustworthy. But you will never know he's trustworthy until you first give him your trust. You have to do that. You believe in, you trust in, you depend on. And then you see whether or not he is who he says he is and he will do what he said he would do. So, I want to invite you in just a moment. I'm actually going to give you an opportunity because some of you, this is the point. You're at the line. You're, you keep backing away. Fear keeps you from trusting. I want to give you an opportunity. To literally, in the most basic sense of the word, like we do with all relationships, to give your trust to Jesus. And then to see from there how trustworthy he is. Because that is the only way you'll know. And then after we do that, the band's going to come back up and they're going to lead us in a final song. And this song, some of the lyrics of this song I just thought were so powerful because they remind us of this simple truth of how extraordinary love really is. That love perfect love it cast out fear that's what john the disciple of jesus who spent three years with him looking in the eyes of love every day this is what john wrote later on in his life he said perfect love and i think he was thinking about jesus perfect love because i have looked in the eyes of perfect love perfect love cast out all fear because when someone loves you perfectly it frees you from any fear you have so this song we're going to sing, here's how it begins. It says, standing here in your presence in a grace so relentless. Grace is simply that unearned, undeserved, oh my goodness, I've screwed up again, God should never. And he goes, yep, you get another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and a hundredth chance, and a two hundredth chance. That's grace. So in a grace so relentless, I am one by perfect love. Because that's what casts out and crushes fear. Wrapped within the arms of heaven in a peace that lasts forever. A peace that you experience because when you are on the other side of that kind of love. And you know this. When you're in a relationship with someone you can trust completely. You don't have to wonder about where that relationship is going to be. You know where you stand. I screwed up again. It doesn't matter. They're not going to abandon me. 
That's the kind of relationship your Heavenly Father invites you into. One that will create a kind of peace that will last forever because you're not worried about him walking away and leaving. Sinking deep in mercy's sea. I'm wide awake, drawing close. I'm stirred by grace and all my heart is yours. All fear removed. Because once you're loved like that, once you realize how trustworthy he is, you don't have to fear anymore. I breathe you in. I lean into your love. Your love love so i want to give you an opportunity if you've been standing there and just haven't been willing to take the step to in your own way to take it as simply as you can right now to give your trust to jesus and see what he does with it so would you pray with me father thank you thank you for showing up Thank you for showing us who you are and what you're like. Most of all, thank you for showing us what perfect love looks like because we would never have believed it if Jesus had not demonstrated it. So thank you so much for that and for inviting us to have a relationship with you, to be a part of your family, not through anything we do, just simply by trusting you. Now, if you're here and this is a step you need to take, just in your own way, tell Jesus this. Just say, Jesus, I've been following along, but I'm ready to believe in. I've been following along, but I'm going to trust. I'm going to move right through my fear. I'm going to move right through my pride. And I want to give you my trust right now. And I'm going to let you show me just how trustworthy you are as I trust in you. So thank you, Jesus, for loving me perfectly and for inviting me into a relationship with you where I'm going to experience freedom, freedom from my insecurities, freedom from my sin, freedom from my pride. Because when you're in a relationship where you're loved unconditionally, you don't have to feel those things. So thanks. That's where I want to go. That's what I want to experience with you. Father, we are so grateful for that, for the forgiveness, for the freedom, for how personal and relational you want to be with us. So we do want to give you our trust. And I'm confident that over and over and over again, you will prove yourself trustworthy because you always have, you always will. So don't ever let us lose sight of that unconditional, extraordinary, perfect love you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.